Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome to another edition of Football Theory. I am your co-host, along with my other co-hosts. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers, but I am joined, pleased to be joined uh, by a, a man, the myth, the legend, uh, Coach Shipley. He has been a high school football coach here in Texas for numerous programs, uh, Burnett, Capel, um, uh, 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 Belton, Rotan. Did I get it right again? Yes, sir. You're while. on a roll, baby. <laughs> uh, Brownwood as well. I mean, coach has been all over the place. Also, uh, coached at Texas. I want to ask you about this a little bit, too. We don't talk enough about your time at Texas. Uh, about five seasons on the staff at Texas as, in, a, in a consultation role, but also uh, as you were basically an analyst for Texas for a couple I was. Of years. My, first, my first job was, was an analyst. I worked with, yeah. with uh, Bo and, and Oscar Giles with the defensive line. You know, at that yeah. time, I was really more of an offensive guy, but Jackson, my youngest son, was on the offense, and a Mac was mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we'll put you over there on defense, which was good because, you know, Bo and Oscar Giles are two of the best defensive line guys in the country, in my opinion. So that was Amen. a great experience for me. And I was an old offensive line coach, so worked really well for me. I enjoyed it. That's a, okay. So can I ask you this before we get, first of all, coach also played at Abilene Christian. He was a player there. Also coached there a little bit. Coach's resume is a little too lengthy for me to get into in detail. <laughs> he's been all around. That's why he's a great ball coach. And also now ShipleyRanches.com is where you need to go to find out more information about what coach is into right now. We know uh, obviously the gene pool is strong with coach Shipley. <laughs> Just mentioned Jackson Shipley, Jordan Shipley, the greatest wide receiver in the history of Texas football. Also a part of, of uh, that family connection and legacy. So we appreciate you going, but ShipleyRanches.com is where you need to go to find out more information about what Coach into. Real quick question before we get into Texas versus Washington, because we got a lot to get into. Coach, I've always thought that coaches, mo every coach that I've met, most of them, their expertise is in one phase of the game or another. There are three phases, offense, defense, special teams, but coaches tend to gravitate toward one of those phases. And then that becomes their expertise throughout most of their coaching career. Have you coached in more than one phase? You just said you were an analyst on the defensive side, old offensive line coach. Uh, you were a fullback when you played. Have you been mostly on the offensive side of the ball? Or have you actually at times switched over and coached a lot of defense and special teams? I haven't. I've coached in special teams. I, my very first job out of, out of college was Graham High School, okay. and uh, and I actually coached the linebackers there. All right. But uh, the rest of my time is pretty much on the offensive stat side until I you know, until Mac hired me in two thousand season of two thousand thirteen as a defensive analyst. Yeah. Um, and so along with Greg Robinson, uh, we came in at the same time. Um, but, you know, I, I really wasn't an offensive lineman. I had never played offensive line. I never coached offensive line. When I got hired at Abilene Christian in 1988 by John Payne, who was the head football coach, John Payne was uh, a great uh, coach in the NFL. He coached uh, okay. with uh, George Allen with the Washington Redskins and um, wow. coach, head coach in Canadian League for 10 years, you know, won the great cup, was a great, was a great coach. He was coaching the offensive line. And uh, – or was going to have to coach the offensive line hmm. because the job on the staff that was vacant was there because the old line left. So Payne being oh. an old line guy said, I'll do that. Well, when I came in into the spring, I was going to coach running backs. And then we just started talking ball and he said, Hey, you know, I, I think you learn, pick up stuff fast. You know, let me see if I can get you ready to coach the offensive line. <laughs> so man, I, so I just dove in, I went, uh, I spent time with the O-line coach at Texas at the time was a guy named Bryant Poole. Okay. I, I, so I came and visited with him, uh, just got a lot of stuff from him. Uh, it was wow. Tom Landry's last year at the Cowboy training at, 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 with the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, the last year that he was, uh, it was 1988, I believe was his last year because I went to the training camp in Thousand Oaks as a guest coach. And uh, at that time, now, now they don't even hardly let guest coaches on the field. But we're in the meeting room. Coach Landry wow. introduced me to the whole team. And I was with Man. the offensive line, of, you know, uh, a long time spent, you know, in the huddle, you know, just doing everything with. So I, so that, that's how I started coaching the offensive line. And I thought I knew some football until <laughs> I started coaching the offensive line. The funnest group of guys I've ever coached, without a doubt. One of them, one of them being uh, a guy who went on and uh, was, uh, was big in WWE, WWF. Uh, John Layfield, who is JBL, 
uh, Bradshaw, oh, they call him. Wow. He was a first team All American, and I've got some great stories about him. I'll tell you, but he was a character. Of course, in the in wrestling, he was a heel. You know, he was kind of the bad guy. Yeah, no doubt. But uh, but he was a character, man. We had a field goal kicker miss a field goal at the end of the game, and he stuffed him in a trash can and rolled him down three <laughs> flights of stairs in the dorm. And so from then on, it was a Dennis Trash Can Brown was a kicker. <laughs> but anyway, fun guys, you know, and I. I I, I really had a great time. Coached coached four years uh, of college offensive line ball, so that that probably helped me more than anything I've ever done in coaching. I've heard from coaches that it's among the toughest positions to coach, if not the toughest to coach. But the, the funnest. Line. It's, it's but coaching. it's the funnest. Okay, it's that, the funnest. That, okay, no I doubt. agree. With you. <laughs> and, and and it's just you know, it, there's just so many things that you have to get your guys ready for. There's never a, never a dull or boring moment you know yeah. they're just so much that so much great. protection and run schemes and all the different looks you got to be ready for it all so it keep you on your toes for sure uh coach that's why i'm glad that we uh we are blessed to have you here because you uh, one more welcome. side note go ahead bill belichick got his start in pro football from john Payne, who was my head coach at abilene christian bill belichick was working a toll booth he was he, he brought him on as a kind of a part-time assistant or whatever. And, and Belichick was working at a toll booth at a tollway uh, somewhere up there, I guess what, what they were with the Redskins and uh, somewhere up in the DC area. And uh, John Payne claims now I've, I've never checked. In fact, I, I was with Bill Belichick when he came at, U, at UT, I was in charge of our uh, coaching clinic and he was our guest speaker at a coaching clinic one year. And so oh, I wow. got to drive him around, spend some time with him. Get I, out I, of here. I forgot to ask him about what? John Payne. Get out uh, of here, coach. Anyway, that was that was a good time. But apparently, <laughs> that's how he got his start. Now, John Payne was, uh, you know, he 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 might stretch the story a little bit. Hey, time hey, to time, but hey, but hey, he was a fun guy, good guy. That is great, cause you just hold up. Did you now we gotta do a whole show one day on just you hanging out with Bill Belichick? Did you just you just, just he drove Bill Belichick around? Oh, oh yeah, we yeah. He Come actually on. worked out. He actually worked out some of our players, a uh, couple of our players. I can't even remember who they were on on the in the stadium, and I so I had to get all that set up for him and Come walk on. him out there and go through a workout with him. Nice. It's a lot of fun. Say, hey, honestly, Coach, that story alone is worth it, right? That, coach <laughs> yeah. that story. I'm yeah, but he's exact. Bill this. Belichick, you know, Bill Belichick is exactly what you, you think he is. <laughs> I mean, he's exactly the same with me in the car, working out players on the field, out at the at the coaching clinic. That's he's him. In, See, I haven't even gotten to your storytelling yet, so we might have the offseason might be perfect for just coaches' stories. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 got, a right I, I got, got a couple. I got a couple. You just told a couple right there that I, I got yeah. a lot of follow-up questions for, but I know we got to get to the game. Man, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what. The, the, don't let me forget to tell you the story about when Earl Campbell came up when, when I was working with Charlie Strong. and All of us were sitting around, and he was he was sitting in Charlie's desk dipping snuff. <laughs> and and the, and when he left after an hour, the whole staff, all they could talk about, they were amazed at how – I never saw the man spit. Did you ever see his spit? I never saw his spit. I didn't see his spit. They were wondering what in the world Earl Campbell was a man swallowing that Copenhagen straight. No, no way. Hey, you talking about yeah. the Skull Brother? Skull Brother. Skull Brother. Yeah, Skull that's right. Brother. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I remember. I'm, I'm a Love Your Blue fan, Coach. So I love Earl Campbell twice. I loved him as a Longhorn. Now I love him also because I'm a Love Your Blue guy originally from H Town. So and he's what, got two and what a great in my humble guy, man. I what love a great guy. guy. What a, I mean, he is a great human being. He really is. For for to be as accomplished as he is. And to be the legend that he is, he when you meet him, you're almost shocked at how humble and, and, and yeah, nice he is. No doubt. Um, all right, uh, let's get we gotta get to it. Before we get to it, though, let me let you know about our great sponsor. Football Theory is brought to you by uh, accomplished uh, Austin Realtor Laura Baker. Laura and the Andy Allen team at Keller Williams can handle all of your real estate needs in the Austin area. Laura is not only a diehard Longhorn fan, but a longtime Austin real estate expert that can help you navigate the difficulty of this real estate market here in Austin. Give her a shout at 512-784-0505. That's 512-784-0505. Uh, and thank you to Laura Baker and uh, to the Keller Williams group for sponsoring Football theory. We appreciate all of their support. All right, coach. I'll just start it out uh, just asking you what your general thoughts on the game were 
uh, Texas losing to Washington 37-31. Um, it seemed like to me that I thought Washington controlled the game for most of the game. It felt that way. It felt like Texas was fighting, scrapping to stay in that game for most of the game. Um, but honestly, they found a way to make it a game and uh, and make it a, a, a game in the last minutes. I, my prediction was it would be the, a last possession game, to come down to the last possession. It did. I just thought Texas would be on the winning end of that last possession. They were not. What were your thoughts about Texas in the Sugar Bowl? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, man. That's exactly how I felt. Had we been able to pull it out miraculously, you're talking about dodging a bullet. I mean, you, you don't say you don't deserve to win, but it never felt it never felt like we were in control enough. Mm. You know, oh, man, we got this. We're going to pull it out at the end. You know, it never felt like that because the things that, you know, all the things that you were talking about with Trice, you know, with Penix, with the receiver, I can't say I'm not sure. Romeo Odunze. Odunze. Yeah, do, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, Bobby had a good – point the other morning on on coffee and football when he said you know the three first round draft picks they had played like first round draft picks i mean yes, there was see. no doubt when the game was over with that mm -hmm. those guys were everything and that's not even counting the offensive line i mean joe moore award winner they they showed they showed why um you know some some people had some crazy stats how you know they i don't know what they're counting pressures but they were saying like he was pressured we pressured him like you know, 22 yeah. times or something. I'm like, hey, the same game I watched. There, it, <laughs> it, it, I mean, maybe he got out of the pocket to try to give his receivers more time to get open, but it wasn't yeah. because we were breathing down his neck about to make a sack, you know. So Penix uh, is everything we thought he was and more the best mm -hmm. pure passer I've seen in a long, long time. His accuracy, not only the strength of his arm, but his accuracy was uncanny. And yeah. then whenever Quinn would get out there and throw the ball, it just looked like he was lobbing it, you know. It just looked like, <laughs> you know, and Penix was just throwing darts. Darts, yep. Yeah. Yep. Now, Quinn has never been that type of quarterback. He's he's not a Michael Penix type guy. He's a manager and makes great plays and has grown tremendously this season. Mm -hmm. But uh, I felt like Texas was scrappy. But, you know, really, it, you know, w when Xavier – well, really – our three top receivers really weren't much of a factor in the game, you know, for a good, good yeah. part of it. Agreed, you know, coach. so, yeah. So when, when you, when you say that, you know, basically our top two receivers were, you know, were irrelevant in the first half. Uh, I would have never believed that. I would have never believed that, especially considering Washington didn't have the best pass defense in the country, even in the conference, even, I mean, they were, they were down the list quite a way. So, so it, it, it was uh, it was frustrating in that sense. You know, I felt like we ran the ball well at times. Maybe should have run it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But but uh, they were uh, everything we were afraid they were. And I think, I, you know, I kind of had this feeling in the, back of my, in the back of my mind. I still wasn't sure that we were going to be as dominant a team, a team as a lot of us would have liked to, to think we were going to be, you know, during that game. A lot of people were like, oh, this is going to be a runaway game. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. you're not watching the same film I'm watching. I agree, yeah, you know? I agree Coach. I'm like, y'all weren't yeah. watching the film. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But but it was a great game, a valiant effort. And, you know, to have a chance down at the end to win it, it's just – that that was an opportunity, you know, for, for, for Quinn to, to cement his name in the annals of, of UT history with one yeah. of the greatest comebacks ever. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll never. I don't know that anybody will ever beat the 2006 Bowl, uh, national championship game with Vince. He's not ever going to be Vince. He's not that guy, but he's he's a great quarterback. And hopefully we'll be back next year to to show us uh, exactly what he's capable of doing and ending his career on a high note. Certainly seems like he's coming back. He's 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 referencing putting in more work with the team and the culture with the team. I think he is coming back. We haven't heard the announcement just yet. Uh, maybe by the time Football Theory posts, uh, that announcement will be out there. But getting back to what you said, Coach, and you know, I I I agree. Their best players played their best games potentially of the season on the biggest stage. As a, a you couldn't ask for more than their three first round prospects all having great games. I mean, Braylon Trice 
He had uh, two sacks, three tackles for loss, one forced fumble. They did not. They, if they did have a plan for him, it didn't work. And the plan they had to stop Michael Penix didn't work at all. He had one of the best performances I think we've ever seen for any opposing quarterback against Texas. I mean, reminiscent of Joe Burrow versus Texas. No doubt. Uh, yeah. No doubt. 29 of 38, 430 yards, two touchdowns. I'll give you a great stat. He he attempted 20 targets. Coach, and I, I saw, you know, PK's game plan. I mean, he mixed it up. He blitzed them. He, second level blitzes, third level blitzes from the edge in the interior, playing bump and run coverage, playing off coverage, playing bail coverage, uh, safeties rotating, single high, double high. I mean, I, he, did. No, he, he threw everything at him. And yeah. He had a he had a solution, an answer for every question, for every problem presented to him. And one thing I think that is the elite quality of Michael Penix that I tried to do it justice, but maybe we didn't do it justice enough. His sack avoidance, ability to avoid sacks, it is next level. He, he only been sacked 18 times the last two years. And yes, the offensive line is good. The Joe Moore award winning offensive line. But coach, you saw it. There were multiple times where t- Texas, some of their best front seven defenders, had a clean shot on the young man. Clean. Ethan Burke was untouched on untouched. that touchdown pass that yeah. he threw that was yeah. bobbled. Right. And Malik Muhammad also had a playoff. Untouched. Right. And I'm sure Ethan Burke, good player, was salivating. Just thinking yeah. to himself, oh, I'm about to light this guy up. Oh, they're they, they not going to block me. I'm coming. And Penix, ever so discreetly, very, very savvy fashion, just, just takes the slides up in the pocket a little bit. Maybe two shuffle steps. That's all it takes for Ethan Burke's angle to be off. Buy himself a little time. Deliver the football on the money. Happened to Byron Murphy too. Byron, Byron I was going to say that's that's the one that I remembered more than that was was Byron Murphy on a little loop came through. Yeah. And you think, man, he's got him. You know, but him. you you don't. And <laughs> but it's it's not like he has cat like quickness. It's not that. It's just his feet and his awareness. Yep. Not taking his eyes off the receivers. It's it's just he's he's going to be a really fun prospect to watch. Yeah, it's going to be a great matchup next week, next Monday. I mean, that's two totally different teams. We'll talk about that. Some yeah, we're going to talk about that because I'm with you. Yeah, because I think Wash is the best offense in the country, guys. They yeah. got the best O line. They're in a wide receiving core better than them three. Them three NFL wide receivers. There may be one quarterback in the country better than Michael Penix, maybe one or two, Caleb Williams, maybe, you know, Jaden Daniels, maybe a Drake May, but it ain't many. It ain't many. Well, I don't know that there's any quarterback that fits their system in the country better than Michael Penix. That's true. No doubt about that in in my mind. Now, who will translate into the best NFL quarterback? I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know, but yeah. He, he's amazing. Now the running back, if he, you know, if his injury is not serious, I'm hearing that he's going to be okay. But you know, if he if he's full full speed, it'll 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 be a good game. But but overall, I just felt like that we were we were just a step behind, you yep. know. And yeah. and but, but but like going back to the, the only thing, well, one one thing that they did with Trice, they moved him around. They didn't keep him on the edge all the time. He nope. came in and got a sack from the interior. One time yep. from the A gap, B gap. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't I, I, I don't know whatever plan we had for him. I didn't see us giving our linemen much help. And I thought I would see more of that. I thought I would see more tight end staying in back, staying in maybe, uh, you know, so, so, something that we hadn't seen. I didn't really see. I think they trusted. Trusted their line and got him this far. And you know we were going to be, be able to take care of him, but he that was, was a miscalculation. Uh, he was <laughs> he, he was he hey, was amazing. Hey, coach, I'll give you another amazing stat about Braylon Trice. You're gonna love this. So he led the he led the college football in pressures last year, right? Led college football in pressures this year too. Um, and uh, of all the first round caliber defensive ends Texas played, nobody has been able to expose Texas O line more than Braylon Trice. He's got more sacks, tackles for loss and tackles against Texas O-line com- than the rest of the elite uh, defensive ends or Ed Rush combined. Remember, they played Will Anderson. He's going to be a first, he was a first round pick. Tyree Wilson was a top 10 pick. Uh, Felix Adenu- uh, and Udike Ozoma, Will McDonald. Those are all first round picks that Texas played last year. And none of them had the amount of sacks that Braylon Trice had. Matter of fact, he had more sacks than all of that group combined. And he did it twice because he had two sacks last year and two sacks this year. 
He had two tackles for loss last year and three this year. So in two games against Texas, he's got four sacks, five tackles for loss, a forced fumble, and I think like 12 tackles or something like that. He had eight pressures against Texas. The rest of Washington had four, had six. So there were 14 total pressures in that game. He had eight of them by his damn self. So I'm with you, Coach. I don't know what the plan was, but it was it was it was insufficient. Or oh, maybe he's just that damn good. Because he Well, he, it's he, the most dominant performance against our offensive line from a pass rusher I've seen since uh Sue in the Big 12 championship. Ooh-wee. Yeah. Now that that was an Albert too. I mean, there's a lot of people they may not have known who that guy was but after the game. They dang sure knew who he was. And yeah. the same thing here. Everybody right. knows Trice now. That's a I great mean, point, Coach. Yeah, he was. And has they, the respect. They did a great job of moving him around. That's just, uh, That was a great coaching uh, game plan by them. Uh, getting back to the defense, let's, let's go to the back end a little bit. We obviously couldn't apply pressure to Michael Penix. Uh, and then when they did get pressure on him, he had elite sack avoidance. But it was the DBs that couldn't hold up coaching. We were concerned about him. Um, that was the strength of yeah. Washington, the best passing af- offense in the country, best QB Texas has played, best wide receiving quarter they have played, most sophisticated passing game they have played. And in that game, it showed that Texas DBs just couldn't hold up in coverage. He was six of eight on passes 20 yards or more down the field, coach. Uh, that is a really high percentage, and they went early. They went deep early and often on that first seventy-something yard uh, pass play that went deep. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Texas blitz. They blitz six, and and Washington kept in. They went max protection, and they kept in seven. They had an answer every time Texas they gambled, did. and they that did. was and the deep ball. Texas just couldn't stop it. And our and our young DBs. I'll admit this. I thought they would go after the safeties, coach. They didn't go after the safeties. No. They went after the corners. Yeah, yeah, they did. It was a long night. It was a long night in that respect. We didn't get any help from our safeties on those vertical routes. Uh, they split our corner safety uh, one time for a touchdown. I mean, they they dialed up everything just exactly right. Yep. It but was. the nice thing was, we, I, I mean, if, if you're looking for a silver lining and all of it, you know, we didn't have guys running wide open like I've seen before, busted coverage and, you know, That's things true. like that. Yeah. So guys were covered. And, and covered well. We just – we didn't adjust to the ball perfectly, which you would have to do with those throws. You would have to break on the ball. Uh, and, and you know, you, you know what it's like to do that. I don't. They never asked me to cover anybody deep, okay? <laughs> but when you're running full speed down the field and you don't know where the ball is, you're trying like mm-hmm. heck just to keep up with the receiver. Yep. And I know that, that you're coached and you're taught, taught to read his eyes read his eyes, read his body language when it when the ball's coming. But some of those guys, man, have gotten really good at not at, at not putting their hands up till the last second to catch a yeah, ball. Yeah, they flash to it. right, Coach. That, yep. that, makes it, that makes it tough on a DB. I love those guys running down the field, and they've already got their hands up. Yeah. And, and, and you notice those guys didn't do that. That is the last second they'd go up and get it with a perfectly placed ball. And sometimes you just – you can have the best coverage in the world – a great throw will overcome good coverage. Great throw, great catch always beats great coverage. And I'm a, I'm a DB, and I'll tell you that. And I like, I love what you said that, Coach, because I used to play the hands and the eyes. I'm a hands-eyes DB. Um, hands flash. I can shoot the hands, shoot my hands through their hands, and I can read the eyes. Eyes get really big. When the ball's <laughs> yeah. You ain't never yeah. seen eyes so big as when a wide receiver is looking at a football that's getting close. Those eyes will tell you everything. And that's I used to play that, but when you got a savvy wide receiver, they I, I know I'm not joking. In the NFL, they they practice like what you just said, coach. Last minute hands, flashing your hands last minute, and they practice comfortable eyes. They they practice relaxed eyes too. Like, don't get big, just get uh-huh. oh, it's next level. And you're right, those guys. They were next level. There's no yeah. question about that. Um, I want to jump to the offense. We're talking about uh, this matchup here because the defense, I think, they they just seemed out. They seemed outmatched. They seemed like they were overwhelmed. They just that's the best offense in the country, guys. It is. Period. That's why the, the it's going to be a fascinating matchup because I think Michigan might be the best defense in the country. Yeah. So, it's be a really compelling matchup. But that uh, they're in the wide receiving core better. They're in the O line better. They won the Joe Moore Award. Quarterback, you could argue, has not won better. And 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 Kalen DeBoer's offense and uh, Gruff is a play caller. They they're legit. They're the real deal. But offensively, I thought Texas offense would score more points. I will admit that I thought they score more points. And we both thought 
it's going to take somebody high 30s to win this game. I, I think your prediction was high 30s uh, for Texas to win, and I had Texas, I think, 41. 30s. I thought we there you go. I predicted 31. Okay, there you go. All right, so I was a little disappointed that Texas didn't move the ball better. I'll give Washington credit. They had a really great game plan. I think the game plan for Washington started, Coach, and what stood out to me, and, and I think, and you know how football works, one team has a great game plan, next team going to take that game plan and build on it. <laughs> Just, sure. That's what happens in football. Their ability to get hands on the football on those early RPO throws of Quinn Ewers. Have you seen a team? No, yeah. Their hands on they that timed many it. Footballs? No, they timed, timed it perfectly. I mean, it's uh, it, it looked like we had Murray back there at quarterback, you know, about 5'8", five, 5'9", <laughs> five, throwing that thing around. It was. Yeah, I, it, it, it was amazing. Here's one thing I want to ask you. What, what was it – what were they doing that you saw – to take away Xavier and take away uh, uh, Mitchell, what what were they doing in the first half? Primarily the first half, but even some in the second half to take them away. Uh, I, I think honestly, between us, I mean between us, we're doing the show here. But I, I think Xavier Worthy was was hurt. I uh, I, uh, yeah. I think I, I don't think he had lateral movement. Um, I think he could run straight ahead, but you know the ankle injuries. I think the lateral movement uh, for him. I mean accelerate decelerating get in and out of those breaks i think he was a little limped up and i think that's what hurt him um and by the way they got one good cover guy who's ken folk malik muhammad jabbar muhammad right, he can, right. he's, a, he's, he's a great kid. yeah he yeah. had a great game he had a great game like that guy is gonna play on sunday so they got a guy they believe they can trust in coverage without helping him very much and from what i seen coach they just dropped they 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 decided to allocate resources to coverage which is why even with the RPO game early on in Texas was out of rhythm in the passing part of the RPO game because they kept getting their hands on balls and Texas kept having the pre-snap penalties and the penalties, putting them behind the chains. And what do we say? You don't want to be in third and long against this group. And Texas was in third and long coach. Texas had 11 third downs. They were in third and long 54% of those third downs. That is a recipe for disaster. But what I think was happening for Texas passing game I believe that they were giving Texas the run game, devoting, allocating resources to stop the pass. I think their RPO is evidence of it because Texas was getting a lot of yardage running the ball out of the RPOs. And that was just Quinn saying we got the numbers advantage in the box. And like you said, and I, I can make the argument too, that after the first quarter, when they're averaging more yards per rush than yards per attempt throwing the football, then maybe that's when Sark probably should have stopped, should kind of, you know, obviously should have pivoted from the script and decided we're just going to run the football. They can't stop it. We're just going to run it, control the clock, keep my defense from being exposed on the field, keep their offense off the field, watching from the bench, and we'll just run it and see if they can stop us. This, this team has the third most missed tackles in the power five. We're going to run it down their throat. And Sark didn't. He still decided to go with the game plan, which was what I agreed with, which was throw to open up the run. But once it had been established that the, the passing game was not going to work really, and you were out of rhythm and the running game was averaging they have this seven yards per rush. Hey, if, if you count it, coach, if you count running back runs. Not Quinn Ewers scrambling because he was actually scrambling pretty well. No Quinn Ewers scrambles. Not Byron Murphy's uh, run for a touchdown. And I didn't even count the two minute drill in here either. Take all that out. Texas was averaging eight over eight yards per rush, handing off to running backs in the first half. Yeah, I, I think that was a miscalculation by Sark to to keep throwing the football when they were giving you the run. And then the, he didn't, and nobody anticipated a third quarter where you would only get the ball five times. Nobody. And I think that on top of the miscalculation in the second quarter, not to run the ball more, that put Texas way far behind. They ended up behind 13 points. That's why we were all shocked they were back in the game. I think that ultimately is what hurt the offense. Their penalties, a great game plan by Washington, getting their hands up. In those throwing lanes of the RPOs, which come out quick, and you will say, and I think you can notice this too, coach. Every now and then, Quinn will throw those things on funky arm angles. He likes to sidearm those RPO throws. He's really confident yeah. mm -hmm. and comfortable. He'll yeah. sidearm them really with low release, uh, uh, at low release points for those yeah. throws. And I think Washington watched film and saw it, and I think they were like, "Hey, man, just get in the lanes and get your hands up." Yeah, you they weren't respecting the run. They yeah. were not respecting the they fake on not. the runs. Exactly. That, that's why they, yeah. Mm -hmm. Boom. So that's yeah, what I'm saying, I, Coach. I, that's what I think happened to the passing game, and ultimately that's what led to Texas being out of rhythm offensively. 
I, I didn't see us doing, you know, uh, our, our all gas, no brakes. I never saw us really go fast, fast, fast. I think probably one reason is because Washington was scoring so, so fast. They, yep. I mean, they, their drives weren't, there weren't a lot of long drives. I, I haven't looked at that to see, see what their drives were, but sometimes uh, you feel like you're, you, you have to catch up offensively yep. and sometimes you know especially if that's your mantra you know all gas no brakes you gotta you know stay and instead of taking a deep breath slowing it down running the ball keeping your defense off the field uh who knows it's so easy for us I, i'm not throwing exactly. any rocks at this coaching staff it's easy for you and i to sit here after we watch the game and you know reviewed it a couple times it's easy for us to come in and say coach should have done this coach should have done that uh, there's a reason why those guys are coaching and you you and I are doing what we're doing, you That's know, because Ain't because they they they're really good at what they do and hats off to them. What a great season. But um yeah, just just wasn't happening for us offensively. Um and and still, but still to have a chance to win the game is incredible. It was incredible. That was incredible. Yeah. And I'll say for the record, I agreed with the game plan that Sark had. I've been on uh, this show and other shows saying, passed over the run, Quinn coming off his best game ever. You want him in a groove and confident because when Quinn's not in a, in a rhythm and he's not in a groove, the offense – is derailed. The offense doesn't find its rhythm. So I was all about passing over the run, even the stats. And you saw it, Coach, and you brought them up too. The stats said the worst defensive down, a pass defense down for Washington was first down. And it's Texas' best passing down is first and second down. And so we threw a lot on we threw a lot on first down. Yeah, so it all fit. But I was, you got to give Washington a lot of credit. They coached them. They noticed something. I think in in the the the, re, the low release point of Quinn on some of those RPO throws, and yeah. they anticipated. This is about self scouting. They anticipated how is Texas going to attack us? Well, if I was Texas, I'd use RPO throws on early downs. Because <laughs> we're back, and I throw a lot of screens. Texas threw a lot of screens. The worst tackling team in college football on screen passes was Washington. So that's why Texas threw a lot of screens early on in the game. But they worked on that and they were ready for those screen passes. They tackled well in the open field. So I just think they did a great job of self scouting and anticipating how Texas was going to attack them. And I thought Texas probably should have run the ball a little bit more. But I can't blame Sark for because then he came on the third quarter. He came out with the intent of running the football, but then he got a fumble. From your running yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. So we you got down trust- two scores. Yeah. You got down two scores. So then you're down two. He's like, I got to throw the football because we're down. And then the few times he did handle the ball, the guys fumbled it. You yeah. Two fumbles in the third, one to fourth. So there's no way Sark could have anticipated how the third quarter was going to play out with five plays and all the turnovers. And I think that's really what separated this group. They, it was tied at halftime. Shouldn't have been, but it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it, yeah. It was Texas fault because Texas fault to get back in the game. Let me ask you about the two minute drill. Texas had two successful two minute drills one led to a touchdown one led to potential a game-winning drive but obviously it came up a little short is it something that could have been working with the two minute drill uh in that game that maybe that type of uh urgency in the passing game would have worked better than a traditional passing game because they seem susceptible to the two minute drill yeah i, I would have again sitting here it's, it's easy days after the game to sit here and yes. say this but but i would i would i would think that I, and I said this earlier. I, I wish we would have gone a little bit more with with uh, fast paced, uh, you know, or what we used to call NASCAR, mm-hmm. you know, offense, you know, all yeah. gas, and and see if we can keep them from getting calls in, you know, keep them from from getting their defensive calls in where they've got, you know, just just a, a standard uh, default defense they have to run when you're when you're going yes. so fast, which is which is one of the reasons. Which is one of the reasons you want to do that, run that type of offense, because defense can't communicate near as effectively. Yep. Uh, I would have liked to have. I would have liked to have seen that. Sure would have. I think. I think that could have made a difference. And, and Sark probably thinking the same thing. You know, I, I don't know, but I, I do think that they were. They the, well, another thing that they were thinking. Washington uh, thinking that is Texas patient enough to to take the run? Are they patient enough to take the run? And certainly it got mm-hmm. to the point where we, we couldn't run as effectively, even though it was a third quarter, you know, you're down two scores, but I don't, I don't know that Texas was patient enough to be able to. Coach, I'm glad you brought that run. term up because I was actually talking to, um, I was talking to Bobby about this actually on the post game. 
it, it, and the term patience, I think, is is key here. In the if you go watch the broadcast from the Alamo Bowl last year, the broadcasters remarked that the they talked to the defensive coordinator from Washington, and he said he didn't think Sark had the patience. I'm paraphrasing. He didn't think Sark had the patience to march down the field with these short underneath throws the entire time. That at one point he was going to take a shot because it's in Sark's nature. He's just he, he he likes the passing game and he likes the vertical passing game. And I think that gamble was right by Washington last year. That that uh, if he takes his shot, as long as we defend the shot plays, it's going to be hard for him to march the length of the field, 13 to 15 plays with that short underneath passing game. And I think, once again, they might have tested the patience of Sark. Like you said, this time in the running game. Let's give him the running game. Let's see if he'll – let's see if he'll – let's see if Sark is cool with being a Big Ten football team, all right, for, for three quarters, which we know Sark is not. Sark doesn't like that. He wants to close with the running game, but Sark wants to be a balanced offense, and he loves the vertical shots. He actually loves exciting plays. He even talks about how he puts in trick plays because not only do his players get excited about it, but he likes to see the fans – get excited about these plays. He feeds off of that kind of stuff. And I wonder if there's a great saying in poker, which I'm not good at, Coach, when you got a, when you got a terrible hand, right? Don't play the hand. You play the man because you got a bad hand. They got a better – Texas got a better hand than Washington. They got a better roster overall. But they played the man, Sark. And one thing about Sark is Sark likes to throw the ball, and Sark wants the big chunk yardage plays. And if you can deny him that, it's possible that he does become a little bit impatient. And in this game, I think he was. I think he wanted, he was trying to throw the football because the game plan, I think, was, was a sound game plan saying you should throw the football. But that layoff had Quinn a little out of, out of rhythm, and it had Texas a little. Remember, Texas was anxious. They started out the game with penalties. They had a penalty on yeah. offense, penalty on defense. So Texas yeah. was also a little anxious, and Washington's game plan was clear. Let's give them the, the, give them the run. Because I'd rather have them handing out the football than throwing to X Man, AD Mitchell, and JT Sanders. Right. Yeah, that's 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 very good point, and I think spot on. I don't think mm -hmm. you know, like I said, look, looking back, looking back now. But that's what makes a good, co a, a, a great coach, a great coach. And yep. Sark will learn. Sark will learn from this. Yes, he will. As 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 great coaches do, they they learn from situations like this. But sometimes you've got to deviate from your game plan because it's, you know, going into the – yeah, anybody could have said our game plan needs to be throw the ball, but throw the ball on their defense because their secondary wasn't – they just hadn't they just hadn't stopped it. They hadn't been that great. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But, but when they drop enough people back in coverage and, and don't respect your play action, then – You've got to you've got you've got to change. You you've got to take take what they're giving you, even though yep. it doesn't make it wouldn't make any sense for them to you know to to just give you the run. But they but I think they were giving it to us. I think they were too. And then, like you said, the third quarter was perfect for their game plan because Texas got down early. They got down uh, double digits, and they had the turnovers. And at that point, you you can't go with the run game. You don't have a yeah. choice. You have to abandon the run game. And run. Now, speaking of abandoning the run game, two more things before we get out of here, Coach. Empty formation was really good. It worked for them. Last season, remember I brought this up. Last season, empty formation was yeah. their best formation and most successful and effective formation versus Washington. Could have been out of circumstance because they didn't have a lot of running backs. Jonathan Brooks was hurt. No Bijan, no Rojo. And I thought maybe it was out of circumstance. That's why it worked really well. Last year, Texas, 87% completion percentage uh, out of empty formation. Um, they had a uh, first down, a first down percentage of 25%. It was actually pretty good. And Quinn was comfortable in it. This game, they were 80% completion percentage on empty plays. That Jordan Whittington catch late down the stretch, that was right. out of empty formation. They had ex an explosive play rate. Uh, over you gone by explosive plays now. They had three explosive plays out of the five empty formation plays. Three of them were explosive plays. I almost wonder if that's something you should have went back to a little bit more, considering you had success with it last year and a lot of success with it. The only play that didn't work out of empty, they had a sack out of empty formation. So there was actually six plays. They had a sack out of empty formation too. That was the first play they ran out of empty. But other than that, man, they were pretty successful running it. And I almost wonder if that would have worked a little bit better. Last thing, and this upset me a little bit, because for two years, Coach, I've been, I've been um, advocating for Texas to run more pony package, two tailback sets. For like two years, I've been on this bandwagon. It works, it works, it works. 
in that game, second drive of the game, they come out in a pony package. They go down and score a touchdown, seven plays running the pony package, averaging over 10 yards per play. Do you know how many times they ran it for the rest of the game? I'm going to say zero. <laughs> zero. That's a little, they ran it twice. Twice. Two more times. And I, the way I tracked the coach, they averaged over 10 yards per play out of the pony package, but only ran it nine times, seven on the second drive of the game to score a touchdown, and only twice the rest of the game. Getting back to your point you made, I know it was only in the script for probably those seven to nine plays, but, man, when it's working that good, come back to it. And I, yeah. and I know you both of those running backs fumbled, so – that's a different discussion, but I think that was also a personnel grouping that they were not prepared for, that didn't work, that it worked really well against them, and that's something I think Sark probably regrets not going back to. Play the hits. I will play the hits, guy. I love, I love, coach. I love leftovers. I love reruns on TV of all great TV shows, and I love playing the hits. And I don't think Sark likes to play the hits. I don't think he likes leftovers or reruns. <laughs> that's a great play out there. Sark won't go back to it. Go back to it, man. It's working. It's working. So there you go. That's my only That's my only gripe. But I will say this. It was a great season. Sark has proven he is the guy. Um, so we like to complain about stuff around here because what else are we going to do? Uh, but there's no well, doubt. This I, was a, a great season, Coach. And this, this team showed an amazing football character. And they did again. They did again. They had no business in that game at the end. And great football character. They fought like a SOB, and they got themselves a chance to win the game late. And what about Jordan Whittington? I mean, what what a great oh. – I, 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 if I could have written a, the ending script, I, w- I would have written uh, Jordan catching the, the winning pass. Who oh, deserves yeah. it more? <laughs> what, what, what a Longhorn, lifetime Longhorn, man. What a, what a great – Man, a young man of character. Yep. Team, team first. Always has been team first, and didn't get the ball near as much this season. I'm sure as he thought he was going to mm-hmm. get the ball, but um, what a great player on the team. He's going to be a big loss for us. I'm glad. Just you what brought he brought to the table in terms oh. of culture, and it ain't about me. It's about me. You know what? What? What was it? The te- what game was it? Where you know TCU? The play way TCU. Yeah, TCU. Yeah. I mean, you lose that game if not for that play. I mean, I guarantee you, every high school coach in the state has that film and showing their players. Let me tell you what a this is what ball players do. You know, unselfish hey, coach, ball players. They don't sit around and mope. They get yeah. they get up and try to make a difference. You know, Coach Terry showed it to the basketball team, I believe. Like, hey, there you go. Yeah. Happened. Fanatical, and what I know we're up against it. We're getting ready to end it, but I'm glad you brought it up, Coach, because I got I, I got so much love for Jay Witt, and this is why I got love for him. And you know this, Coach, because you've coached a lot of ball. You need guys like that in your locker room because this is the kind of guy that Jay Witt is. He thought about quitting football after all the injuries because that's a lot of depression to go through. It's an identity crisis because so much of your identity is linked to football and being with the team. And so I convinced him, hey, man, we need you, dog. We need you. And I think he was right because what Sark was looking for was a walking testimony. And when I remember I walk in testimony every day, we're walking through that locker room. This is a guy that was dealing with injuries and battled through, persevered. And he had to, in order for him to play it through an entire season, he had to learn my body, my physiology is not like everybody else. I got to come in an hour and a half early and work in a training room just to get stretched and warmed up for practice. I got to stay an hour later than everybody else. I can't just go home and kick it. I got to stay an hour later just so that I can make sure that I'm ready for the next day of practice to perform at a high level. And by the way, I can't eat like everybody else eats. This is something Jay would admit. I got to change my diet. I can't eat pizza and wings and barbecue every day. I got to eat different things because my body is, is, is a little bit more sensitive, all right, to injury. So I got to do everything I can to be the best player that I can be. He is, I think his brother and his family are power lifters. When he came to yeah. Texas, he kind of swole yeah. up. Oh, yeah. He yeah, kind of no wound doubt. real tight. And then he yeah. learned, you know what? Flexibility is more important to me. I'm pulling muscles. I'm, I'm injuring myself because I'm lifting a little bit too much. So he changed his lifting. He changed habitually. He changed a lot about himself, his habits. And you know, so, uh, Coach, that culture is just habits. Habits every day with the same vigor. Getting up every day, attacking every task with the same attitude. Right. How you do anything is how you do everything. And you do that for 365 days a year. You know what I mean? And you can, you become obsessed with the process. And that's this guy walking through that locker room every day. And everybody's seeing 
man, Jay, we're putting in the work. He's here early. He's staying late. He perseveres. He doesn't, he doesn't complain about not getting the ball. Matter of fact, he likes to block. He, the unselfishness of his testimony. Brennan Marion says, how, what you do without the football shows how much you love your teammates. Damn, Jay Witt loves his teammates. Doesn't he, though? Right? And those, those testimonies, you know that, Coach. They force anybody watching them in locker room to go, am I doing enough? Am I committed enough? Am, yeah. I, am I committed like he is? Because if, if I'm not, maybe I need to check myself. And that testimony is powerful in a locker room, man. So I'm with you. I'm going to miss them because those are the kind of guys you need. And the, 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 the value they have. You can't even quantify. You can't. There's no way. And, and and I'm hoping we'll see residual effects of that. Yes, in you the will. future, the younger yeah. guys, like you were saying, the, oh, oh, okay, man. I just thought I played hard. I just thought <laughs> I was dedicated. I just thought, you know, no. I guarantee you, Jay Witt, his mindset was, I, I'm going to be the very best that I can genetically be. Yep. You know, and that's all you can do as a player. You you know, everybody can't be Roy Williams. Everybody can't be, you know, Vince Young. Everybody. But I got to be as good as I can. My, as good as my genetics will allow me to be. Yep. And, you know, it's just to me, it's just like you know, tackling. You know, tackling is I used to say 90 percent want to. I, I don't know that it's 90 percent want to. A lot of people want to make tackles, but a whole lot of it is. If I want to get that guy down, I get him down. I don't have to be told to drive my feet. I don't have to. I don't have to be told to, you know, to to finish to finish the tackle. You know. Yep. You you just it, it, here's what I used to tell my players. If I gave you a million dollars, if I <laughs> would you be the first one down on the kick coverage? If I Hell said yeah. first one down is going to get a million dollars. Woo! Yeah. I, I'm there. First one with contact. I'm, I'm there. Okay. 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 All right. So <laughs> so. It's, it's kind of like that old joke, you know, about that guy, you know, he, he, he's talking to his wife and he says, she said, well, I sure like Richard Gere. Well, yeah. Well, you know, would you have sex with him for, you know, a hundred dollars? And it gets up to me. She goes, well, I might. He goes, well, son, now, now we figured out your mother's a whore, you know, <laughs> now, now, now we're just talking about price now, you know, <laughs> so, so, it's all, so it's all about attitude. It's all about perception, yep. you know, and, and effort. You're right. Effort. It is. How bad do you want it? You know, and Jay Witt wanted it bad. He he wanted it bad, and I hope that we see that legacy that he yeah. set, which we hadn't seen in a long time on the forty. I don't think we've seen that in a long time on the forty. Ro now, Rojo, Jordan, was, Ro Rojo has something. Ro Rojo, that's a good point. Yeah, good point. and I think Rojo, I think yeah. every class, I think we're gonna see this every year. An example of this, right, Coach? The example of a walking testimony. If you want, if you want to know what to do and how to conduct yourself, look at me. Look at the way I do it. You ain't got to ask me. Just watch me. And those kind of guys Jay are powerful, Witt. man. Could it be Jay Witt saw that from Rojo? I agree. I'm with you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, and I think point. it's passed down, Coach. Point. Yeah, yep. that's a great point. Yeah. Um, all I right, hope, Coach. I hope we continue to see that. I agree with you. All right, before we get out of here, let's uh, thank our sponsor again. Football Theory is brought to you by the accomplished Austin Realtor, Laura Baker. Laura and the uh, Andy Allen team at Keller Williams can handle all of your real estate needs in the Austin area. Laura is not only a diehard Longhorn fan, but a longtime Austin real estate expert. Give her a shout at 512-784-0505. That's 512-784-0505. Um, all right, Coach. Thanks. For, oh, man. Coach, one day we're going to do a football theory on just your stories. You dropped like three or four of them in here, man. It was great. Like a, like all old coaches, I got lots of stories. That's how you know a good old ball coach. You got lots of stories. Uh, but, Coach, thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. And we'll uh, obviously link up next time, next week, for another edition of Football Theory. I enjoyed it. Thanks, man. All right. Uh, and now, uh, for Coach and for myself, we'll join you guys next time right here on, on Texas Football for Football Theory. Hook them.